<laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to church. Hey, we're here. We made it. We missed last. Anybody miss last week? I missed last week. Oh boy. Yeah. And when you're not in church and you're used to being in church, you miss it if you haven't been there. And uh, anyway, welcome. It's uh, great to be here. We celebrated Pat's life yesterday, and uh, what a great celebration. That are, those are the flowers from the family, and uh, we left those up there. That's in memory of Pat today. So we welcome you. The choir's back today. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, Mission Possible. We're going to talk about how it is possible to be like Jesus, and we're going to do that today. So welcome, and Becky has announcements. Yes, I do. Um, the Chosen Adult Small Group begins today here at Cuba United Methodist Church. Um, are we meeting in the basement, the fellowship hall? Following worship today, the class will begin with lunch. Then at noon each week, there will be an episode of The Chosen, followed by a 30-minute discussion. Charge Conference this year is here at Cuba UMC. Tomorrow, Monday, January 22nd at 6 p.m., we will join a district Zoom meeting. The Administrative Council is encouraged to attend along with anyone else, as this is an opportunity to learn more about our church and other churches in our district. Thanks to the Reverse Advent Collection, 220 items were delivered to the food pantry. <clears throat> Yay, that's awesome. And the food pantry needs your help. Fridays are a busy day at the food pantry. If you can spare two to three hours from 8 a.m. to 11, this says 11 p.m., but I'm thinking that's 11 a.m. Yeah, it's 11 a.m. That would be a really long day. On a Friday or Fridays, the food pantry has inside work that they need help with. More hands make less work. If you have any questions, Bruce Bailey has the answers. And next Sunday, January 28th, is our next laundry day. We will be at the laundromat, and this time has changed uh, to accommodate for our small group, but we'll be at the laundromat from 2 to 4 p.m. or until our money runs out because we've had a really big response lately. Um, got two weeks of birthdays. Last week's birthday on January 14th was Lucas Welch. On the 19th was Bruce Bailey, and on the 20th was Hudson Hammonds. And this week's birthdays on the 23rd, Cooper Mel, the 25th, Blakely Hammonds. Ooh, you got a big, big month for birthdays, don't you, Cindy? On the 26th, Cheryl Wilkerson, and on the 27th, Clint Poss. So, as our acolytes bring in the light of Christ into our worship, let us be in an attitude of meditation.
Amen. Amen. And the scripture for that says, God, uh, my God, it's you. I search for you. My whole being thirsts for you. My body desires you in a dry and tired land. No water anywhere. Yes, I've seen you in the sanctuary. I've seen your power and glory. My lips praise you because of your faithful love is better than life itself. So I will bless you as long as I'm alive. I will lift up my hands to your name. That's from Psalm uh, 63, 1 through 4. Call to worship is on the screen as we begin our worship this morning. God knows each one of us personally, and God loves each one of us personally. Thanks be to God for such Such wondrous wondrous love. love. Come this day into the presence of God. We come with overflowing hearts. Celebrate God's mercy, love, and compassion. Praise be to God who offers us hope. Amen. 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 If you would please rise for our opening hymn, Here I Am to Worship. It will be on the um, big screen up there, and it is followed by He is Lord. God, we come to you this morning with all of who we are. We lay our lives down for this hour for you, for your will and your ways. You are God and we are not. We have been recipients of your great love. Now we are your audience. Take center stage in our hearts, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill our hearts with the fire of your love. We come to worship and bow down to the Lord God, our Maker. 
have your way with us today, O Lord, in Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now it's time for our special music by our choir, The Road to Glory. Time for our, ch our children's time. I know I'm not a familiar face up here, so work with me, all right? So I have a question for you and for the congregation. How many of you guys like pickles? Go ahead and raise your hand. All right, good. And how many of you don't like pickles? Okay. So for those of you that do like pickles, if you go to your refrigerator and open it up, you can see that the pickles are in a see-through jar. Isn't it nice that they're in a see-through jar? You're able to see that the pickles are inside without having to open it. You know, that's a really nice thing about pickles. And for those of you who don't like pickles, you can walk up to the fridge, open it up, and see that there are pickles inside so you can avoid them. <laughs> Either way, it's nice to see into the jar so you know that there are pickles inside you are able to decide if you want to eat them or not. Now imagine that pickles did not come in a see-through jar. This would be a lot of hassle, am I right? 
you would have to reach into the fridge, take the jar, open it up, just to see that there are pickles inside. Now imagine you don't like them. That would be terrible, right? Because now you have a dilemma. So isn't it nice that they're in a see-through jar, right? Right? Now, I would also talk, like to talk to you about windows. Why do you guys think that windows are useful? And why do you guys think that we have windows? So take the windows here in the sanctuary, for example. They help us see outside. And since we can see outside, the light can come in, right? So it sounds like windows are pretty good and useful things. In today's scripture story, we hear Philip tell his friend Nathaniel about Jesus. At first, Nathaniel is not nearly as excited about Jesus that Philip is, but Nathaniel does agree to go and meet him anyways. When Jesus and Nathaniel meet, Jesus then says some things that help Nathaniel know that he really does understand him. It's almost like Jesus can see into his mind or something, and Nathaniel thinks that that is really cool. But then Jesus tells him, if you think that's cool, just wait and I, until I help you see heaven open up. Nathaniel agrees that that would be even more amazing and chooses to follow Jesus as his disciple. What Jesus meant by seeing heaven open up is that if Nathaniel or Philip or anyone else chooses to follow Jesus and learn what he is teaching them, then they will be able to see and understand who God is and what he wants for us. See, what I like about today's story is the reminder that the when disciples follow him and learn from him, he is like a window that helps the disciples better see and know God, or like a jar of pickles that helps the disciples see what is inside without having to open it up. But they don't just learn from Jesus how to see. They also learn how to become a window that helps God's light shine through them. This helps even more people be able to see who God is, or even become a jar of pickles for God so others can see him in you without having to guess if he is in there or not. And guess what? It's not just the first disciples who could be windows that let God's light shine into the world or be jars of pickles so God can be seen in you from far away. We, too, can choose to follow Jesus and learn what he taught the disciples about God. And as we learn about Jesus taught, we are learning how to be a window that shines God's light into the world and helps others to see God better or be his jars of pickles so others can see Jesus in you at all times. And that's the good news for today. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for giving us Jesus as a window into your love. God, please help us to be windows and lights or even your jars of pickles as we go into the world this week. Help us to open your world and to love others around us. Please be with us and keep us safe and warm this week. Thank you for loving us. Amen. So, you know, Sierra had to sit on that for a week. She was so disappointed last Sunday. I prepared this and we didn't have church. And I said, you know what? There's next week. She goes, are you doing the same sermon? I said, yes. Good. Thank you, Sierra. That was, was wonderful. All right. We're breaking open the Word of God here this morning. Here's the, the scripture that she referred to and that I'm going to preach on today. The next day, Jesus wanted to go into Galilee, and he found Philip. Jesus said to him, follow me. And Philip was from Bethsaida and the hometown of Andrew and Peter. And here, I got more. Here, I got more. 
Oh, there it is. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and the prophets, Jesus, Joseph's son from Nazareth. Nathanael responded, Can anything good come from Nazareth? Philip said, Come and see. Jesus said, um, saw Nathanael coming toward him and said about him, He's a genuine Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, How do you know me? Jesus answered, Before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are God's son. You are the kingdom of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. I assure you that you will see heaven open and God's angels going up to heaven and down to earth on the human one. This is the word of the Lord for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God for his word to us today. Um, before I get into a golf joke, and I was going to tell you ahead of time, Ben, if you know this joke, don't give away the, uh, the uh, punchline, okay? But before I do that, I just wanted to call attention again. Can anything come from good from Nazareth? Can anything good come from Cuba? Can anything come from Dixon, my hometown? You know, I mean... Just think about that. Nazareth, Nazareth was a small town. This is encouragement for us of, of, of small town folks because Jesus sees past all of that. By the way, I just want to let you know, Jesus loves us, okay? Even if um, those Pharisees or whoever said that doesn't. All right, so um, Jesus and Moses went golfing one day. <laughs> and Jesus was about to hit a shot. And he said, hey, Moses, watch this. Just like Arnold Palmer, he said. <laughs> Moses said, Jesus, you can do anything, but don't try to be Arnold Palmer. And Moses said, Jesus, or Jesus said, no, watch this. Just like Arnold Palmer. Okay. Jesus hit the ball in the water, so Jesus asked Moses, hey, go get the ball. Moses parted the water and got the ball. This continued for about 15 minutes. Finally, Jesus hit the ball in the water for the seventh time. Please get my ball for me, Jesus asked Moses. Moses said, no, I told you to quit trying to be like Arnold Palmer. I'm not getting it this time. Jesus walked across the water, reached down, got his ball, and while he was doing so, a couple rode by in a cart and said, who does he think he is, Jesus? And Moses said, no, he thinks he's Arnold Palmer. <laughs> Love that. All of us can't be Arnold Palmer or Tiger Woods or Ben Gibson. But all of us can be like Jesus. Right? We've been called to be like Jesus. We've been called to love like Jesus, to make a difference like Jesus, to change the world like Jesus. The Bible says we've been empowered to be like Jesus. I think... That's what maybe compelled Philip and the rest of them to just drop their nets and follow him. Right there, no questions asked. They just went. Follow me, he said. And they did it right there on the spot. Now, that's a great call for an adventure. And meaning in, in, those, uh, and, and meaning in those two simple words, Philip and the disciples couldn't resist it. Come. Uh, come and see, follow me. Those are the things that he said. Jesus' irresistible call, also seen later in the Gospel of John, you will do greater works than I because I'm going to the Father. Now that, how's that possible? To do works greater than Jesus because Jesus has always been. In the first chapter of John we read, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, but Jesus was on the earth in human form from his influence and, um, and was limited. Um, he could only heal one person at a time and teach groups one at a time. But when Jesus went back to the Father, the Holy Spirit came to live in each of his followers. 
In this way, Jesus' influence is multiplied through us, and we can reach the whole world together. I love that pickle and window thing, because that's exactly what it's, it means. It is, we are to be the window to Jesus. This is what it means by Jesus doing greater works than him. We have been given power from the Holy Spirit to be like Jesus in this world. This is why our mission is to make disciples uh, is, is, is even possible. But Jesus not only spoke about the power to be like him in John, it also is mentioned in the synoptic gospels. That's, what, uh, that's a fancy word that we use in seminary for uh, uh, Mark, Matthew, and, and, and Luke. Uh, synoptic because they all kind of uh, are more together. They, they all kind of weave the same story uh, much more than, and they all borrowed from each other is what they believe uh, uh, when they wrote it. But, um, um, uh, you know, John's so different. Uh, but we give a lot of credence to people's last words. Now, we don't do that much anymore, but we used to in history. Um, we give credence to people's last words. And so we certainly do with, with Jesus. Um, we believe what people say is important before they leave the earth, right? You ever paid attention to Jesus' last words to his disciples before he left the earth? In uh, Matthew 28, 16 through uh, 20, last words to his disciples were, Go and make disciples. In Mark 6, 15, Jesus' last words were, Go into all the world and proclaim the good news of all the creation. In Luke 24, 47, 49, Jesus' last words were, Repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be are, are to be proclaimed in, in his name to all the nations. And then he said, stay here until you've been clothed with power from on high. We've been get, given the power of the Holy Spirit to transform the world for Jesus. We have the same power the early church had. But here's the key. We have to do something with it. We have to do something with this power. When Jesus said, go make disciples, he was giving the Great Commission. Not a great reflection, not a great suggestion or a great option. It was a Great Commission. It's a mandate from Jesus Christ. Jesus made no distinction between his followers and his witnesses. Discipleship and evangelism cannot be separated. A faith worth having is a faith worth sharing, but that's the rub, isn't it? That's the rub of faith. It's easy to come and to worship, and it's easy uh, to go to Bible study. It's easy to serve the church in some way. Um, I mean, they have their own levels of difficulty sometimes, but sharing our faith, that's a whole different matter. Many want to leave that job to somebody else. Maybe the preacher. I would remind you that Jesus called 12 disciples, not 12 preachers. Okay, so... Uh, I have my own job. I, I have to be doing these things too. But I'm not the only one. We all are. Um, so have you ever been to a new restaurant and um, the food is fantastic and the service is great, but there's not very many people there at that restaurant? Um, I've done that. I remember a few times doing that with friends years ago and, and there becomes this sense of, oh my gosh, we have to tell people about this place. It's great. But nobody's here. <laughs> it would be a shame if they went out of business. Well, you know, I'm a pastor. But I'm also a preacher. I'm always thinking, how quick are we to share something good? We'll tell everybody about a good restaurant or a good book, won't we? We'll tell everyone about a good restaurant, a good book, a good movie. We'll tell the whole world to go see it. When we find a good deal somewhere, we'll skywrite it. <laughs> um, when we get, find a bargain somewhere, shopping. Yet, when it comes to sharing the greatest news in the universe, mom is the word among so many Christians today. I love the story found in the first chapter of Acts. Jesus is ascending into heaven, and his followers are looking up in awe. And Jesus is ascending, and he's telling his followers to go and be witnesses. And his followers just keep looking up. And when Jesus disappears, 
two men appear and basically say, stop looking up into heaven. Did you hear what Jesus said? Go and be witnesses. I know many Christians, including myself a lot of times, who are still looking up instead of looking out. Jesus is telling us today, stop looking up, up, look out, I'm out here, I'm out there, I'm in here with you, go out there, because I'm out there too, waiting on you to help me change people with my love. God does the changing, but he does it through us. Be my witness. Stop looking up. Look out. I'm out here in the world with those who are suffering. I need you to be my hands and my feet. Will you help me? Now, you may be thinking, yeah, but you know what? Sharing faith is so personal. Yep, it sure is. The consequences of sin are personal. Living with no hope is personal. Living life with no meaning or purpose is personal. It's personal tragedy. We've been given power from on high to transform the world. With God's love. We have a source of hope and strength to get through all the things we get through. Will we share that? So others can get through. I mean, if we had a cure for cancer, we would tell everybody. We have a cure for the meaningless life and spiritual death. What keeps us from sharing that? I know that word witness conjures up a lot of negative images. I know that many people have given witness a bad name. We think of people passing out tracts and holding up signs and grabbing people by the collar and and, and screaming about Jesus with judgment in their eyes, you know. Quite often, those who loudly profess to follow Christ don't really behave like Christ. Shane Claiborne, wonderful young Christian writer and thinker, talks about walking into downtown Philadelphia, where he lives now, uh, with some friends, and watching the magicians, performers, and artists perform on the street. They came across this preacher and he was standing on a box screaming into a microphone and beside him was a coffin with a fake body in it. Fake dead body inside the coffin. He talked about how everyone was going to die and go to hell if they didn't know Jesus. Right there on the streets of Philadelphia. And all Shane could think of, all he could think about was to jump up on a box beside him, yelling at the top of his lungs, God is not a monster! We talk about, I'm fond of John 3.16, I'm sure you are too, for God so loved the world, But the Bible also says in John 3.17 that God did not send Jesus to condemn the world, but to save it. It's high time we start believing that, and more importantly, living like it. I saw a meme on Facebook this week that said, Jesus did not come to condemn the world. I'm pretty sure he didn't call you to do it either. The more I read the Bible and the teachings of Jesus, the more I see his assertion, that uh, Claiborne's assertion, that Christianity spreads not through coercion or force, but through fascination. People are fascinated by the love of Jesus. When they're reflecting that love, people want to know about it. 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16 says it well. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you, Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. It's so simple. We are filled with the hope and the love of Christ. People will want to know about it. We live in a world filled with people that have no hope. So when others see our hope, they want to know what's going on. 
How many of you have gone on the laundry ministry? How many of you have been there, right? I am told, and I, I think I, well, I saw it once myself, but what we do there, and I know, and I know this, because I had been there at least a couple of times, and they handed me a bag, by the way, of quarters and said, go to it and talk to people. But what, what happens is that, you know, if you haven't been there, we have these quarters and we have them in bags, and when people come in, we just ask them, may we, may we pay for your laundry? We don't say we're going to do your laundry. We say, may we pay for your laundry? Their response often is, why? Why would you do that? That's where the fascination comes in. And we said, do that because Jesus did that for me. Right? God's love, that's why we do it. People are fascinated by that. You and I were once fascinated by that. Are we still? Yeah, I, I think we are. But when we are reflecting that love, people want to know about it. It's, um, they'll seek us out. All right. Ten years ago, something fascinating happened at a high school in Unionville, Tennessee. Um, I was li- living down there at the time, in, in cl- about an hour from Unionville. Ter- and the boot hill were from, you know, there's like four states right, <laughs> right there. So, but, and, I, and I made some hospital visits in Unionville, Tennessee. Um, but, uh, or no, that was Union. Never mind. Uh, but this is closer to Nashville. Three nominees for Homecoming King. This is the real, the real story that happened in Unionville, Tennessee. Three nominees for Homecoming King, King decided that if one of them was awarded the crown, they would give it to a junior named Scott Maloney. Scott Maloney has Williams Syndrome, a neurological disorder that affects learning and speech. When Jesse Cooper's name was called as a winner at the ceremony, the principal announced that the nominees decided... What they decided to do, and I've been blessed with so many things, Cooper told ABC News, Nashville affiliate, WKRN-TV. I just wanted Scotty to experience something great in his high school days. When they called Scotty's name, his eyes got really big. I don't know that it registered exactly what was happening, the story said. But, we, uh, but he knew something was said Maloney's teacher, Liz Hessel Gassaway. She told abcnews.com, It was very, very emotional. The, the crowd erupted with cheers, and Maloney got a standing ovation. WKRN reported as he was awarded his King Medal. Everyone loves Maloney at that school. He wears that medal everywhere he goes. I, bring, I tell you that story because that's the kingdom of God. The fascinating love of God made headline news. It makes it every once in a while. When we Christians embody the love of Jesus, we will get people's attention. If we embody the garbage that's in the world, and I'm talking about not just sin, but I'm talking, well, it is sin, but I'm talking about what, what passes off for Christianity for some people today, and that's Anyway, we, we repel people if, it's, if we don't embody the love of Jesus. Um, and when we do that, the world wants to know about it. And they want it too. So, okay, finally, if you're looking for more motivation, if you haven't had enough motivation yet, read the last chapter of John. In that final chapter, we read that Jesus was eating breakfast with Peter and, John, and, uh, and, and Jesus. And remember, uh, Peter had denied Jesus three times, and, and now um, Jesus calls Peter over. Peter, do you love me? Peter, somewhat surprised by the question, of course, you know I love you, Lord. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Jesus asked Peter the Question, second time, and a third time. And, and after Peter affirmed his love, Jesus' response was the same, feed my sheep. If we love Jesus, we'll feed his sheep. Do you love Jesus? For goodness sake, don't keep it to yourself. Share that love. 
world desperately needs it. God is saying, can I get a witness? Amen. the end of my sermon, that was our prayer. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Joys. Um, I'll give you a joy. Spent a lot of time at uh, a, a warming center at Recline most of the week, and it was a joy to see um, a little boy and, and his mom and, and others uh, that had no place to go, and uh, and, and uh, a Vietnam veteran, which, by the way, they're the largest group of people who do not have a home in the country are Vietnam veterans. Let that sink in a little bit. Um, uh, but it wasn't just for people that didn't have a home. It was for people who didn't have adequate heat. But it was cobbled together at the last minute, and now we got it together, and it's going to ha- Yes, Sierra? I just kind of want to add on a little bit. Um, Grandma and I worked our butts off. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, 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 and for now, they are, um, Minister Alliance is putting them up until this cold snap next day or two, maybe even tomorrow. Uh, and there's been all kinds of people offer to donate to that. So that is a joy that people have responded. And uh, we're going to do a little organizational meeting uh, this next week. Um, and uh, we're going to bring a lot of... Uh, Hey, her grandma brought me in and, into this and said, the Minister Alliance needs to be involved in this. I went, yes, we do. And, uh, and, and so um, we got involved in that. I'm not the president of the Minister Alliance or anything. but um, Anyway, it's a joy because what did we do? We shared the love of Jesus with people. I'm not going to, I just, I'm going to stop there. Um, what are other joys that you might have today? Yes, Joyce. Wonderful service. We had a bagpiper here yesterday. If you weren't here, you should have been here. It was <laughs> uh, anyway. It was beautiful. Pat is of Scottish high heritage. I, I didn't know that, but it's wonderful. And uh, we put to, uh, they put together a wonderful. And you, the church, ministered to that family and showed the love of Jesus, and that's wonderful. And of course, we miss Pat too. Uh, other Hi. yes. That's right. Amen. That's wonderful. Um, other joys? I have one. Yes. I have two, actually. Maybe three. Um, well, is one of them that you lived through the Chiefs game? Well, we'll get to that. Okay. All right. All right. More importantly, it, it just fills my heart 
that Sierra was such a big part of that. And yes. I think I think that is a testament to some of her upbringing in this church. I really do. So good job, Sierra. And wow, the children's service this morning. I think we found a new substitute for Casey. Um, but yeah, because you were the substitute before. I was. I was. <laughs> but we got you now. Okay, sorry. So go that ahead. is I'm a big joy. Quiet. And it is a joy that Mark and I survived the Chiefs game last Saturday, <laughs> the coldest game in Arrowhead history. And it was actually not awful. It was fun. And you knew it was coming because I'm here. So um, the Chiefs are on again today. So go Chiefs. <laughs> I love it. I'm sorry, Ben. The Cowboys are out. I'm sorry, Dean and Cheryl, the Packers. I really am. The Packers are gone. We, but... minister, we ministered to Ben <laughs> earlier this week about that, right? No, oh, okay. Um, other joys. Yes, Janet. Amen. Thank you, God, for that. And my concern is for Carolyn. She will be having the same surgery this week. Okay. And so we ask for prayers for Carolyn this week. Carolyn Brinkman will have surgery this week. Prayers for Carolyn. So other concerns that we want to lift up, Sierra? <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I've, I've been on the speech team before. Of course, it was, you know, so long ago in history when Moses was alive. But no, it wasn't that long. But it might as well be. Anyway, pray, prayers for Sierra. Yes. So we need to go back to school. So we need the weather. Need the weather to be better so you can go back to school. Yes. Amen. Yes. We need to go back to school. But enough is enough. <laughs> yes, enough is enough. Um, in concerns, also, I want to lift up uh, Becky Hubbard, um, and she has been um, uh, battling cancer and, and chemo and those sort of things, and uh, uh, she has good days and bad days, and she called me, on a, on, called me back on a good day and left a message, um, but continued prayers for her. It's a, it's a battle, and, um, and she's got some, uh, let's see, when's that? She's got a, uh, a 23rd, she has a follow-up appointment, Okay. Um, and then, of course, like it's already been mentioned, but we want to continue to uh, uh, lift up Pat's family, but also our quilters. Okay, they lost one of their own. They, that, that's that's a big loss right there. Um, so let's pray for our quilters, uh, Cheryl. Well, yeah. Um, they're not going to say, hey, it's nice for us to be back, so thank you, Cheryl, for reminding me of that. And I did speak to them earlier. It is great to see you all, and um, um, it's always great to see you. But you've been watching us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I know you do. So we'll continue to pray for, for Lawrence and Ruby and, and uh, the health journeys that they're on right now. Mitch Hukins? Yeah, okay. All right. Any others? John? Carissa Coleman. Carissa Coleman. And also, uh, Leslie and I have to take a trip to Lebanon tomorrow for a doctor's appointment. I'm getting a friend. There's no ice. Okay. Should you go tonight, maybe? <laughs> okay, sorry. I've. Yes. Earl Kruboff. Thank you. On his passing. Anything else? All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we begin silently and listen for the still small voice of the Lord.
Lord, you've come to the lake shore, looking neither for wealthy nor wise ones. You only ask me to follow humbly. The words from this lovely hymn paint pictures of hardworking people, go about their daily tasks, when all of a sudden we're confronted by Jesus. The same Jesus who long ago called those first disciples calls each of us today. Our lake shores are different. There are places where we work and where we live. Yet in this hymn, Jesus is coming for each one of us and calls each one of us just as we are and inviting us to follow him humbly as we are. We lifted up some names of, of, of some deeply loved ones today in our prayerful petitions for God's healing and for God's help. We've uttered in our hearts names and situations that would break our hearts to say them out loud. And God hears all our cries and, and responds in love. This is one of the faithful works of the church. The work of prayer and asking for God's healing mercy and blessings. As we have offered our prayers, let us also offer our lives, laying them down for you, trusting in your love and call to us. And we respond with confidence, for it is in Jesus' name that we pray. And it's in Jesus that we pray the prayer that he taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, Our Father, who, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the, and the glory, glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. It's time now for um, the giving of our tithes and offerings. Our ushers, please come forward. Please stand for our doxology.
Greatest gift we've ever been given is our Lord Jesus. These monetary gifts that first were yours and then ours, we give back to you, O God. Use them and use us. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. And our sending hymn is When We All Get to Heaven, page 701. I've heard it said that the two most dangerous words we can say in prayer, well, three, Lord, use me. Why is that dangerous? Because if you pray it with sincerity, he will. He's used us all, and he continues to do so. He used Pat. He's using you. He's using me. Take the good news. In the name of Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Shalom. Amen. Amen.